One second while I sync both cameras. Greetings, unsettled souls! <laughs> Welcome to the Correct Views. Sam I B. McGangy doing political commentary for the Media Speaks. Member of the band uh, Passing Time. You're pounding away in the background there. We're working on a CD, you know. Um, more on that as it develops, but it's going very well. Low def there, high def there, hello all. Uh, welcome to the show. We got a, a ton of news to get to, so I'm not going to blather on all day. I'm just going to get to it. Um, report. YouTube allows Islamic State videos to remain online for days, sometimes for weeks. Now, I need you all to particularly pay close attention to what I'm saying. And once again, we have started the word of the day. When you hear the word of the day, and I can't believe I have to say this, not only do you have to say what the word of the day is, but you have to send me an address so that I can send you cool stuff, like this and other cool stuff. But I can't send it to you if I don't have your address. So look for the word of the day. It's going to be going on at some point during the show. Okay, check this out, friends. How many of you know that Mark Dice has a terrible time trying to get his videos monetized? How many of you know that I have trouble with it? Now, you guys know I drop an F-bomb every once in a while, but on a scale of 1 to 10, I, I'm a, I always have something in my hair when I go live. It never fails. It's great. On a scale of 1 to 10, I'm like a solid, I don't know, PG-13. It's really not that bad of a show here, okay? We all know this. All right, all right I want you to check this out. I'm going to go to screen share, and uh, you guys on uh, HDEF will be able to see this. Let's go to my... Uh, my videos, shall we? If I can know how to run my own computer. Um, you go into my videos. Well, actually, I'm in uh, I'm in the media speaks right now, so I'd have to go into mine. There's a number of videos that cannot be monetized. I forgot that I am in the other channel. They can't be monetized, and I would show you if I wasn't in the media speaks uh, library, but live I am. The, YouTube will let you monetize videos, however. If you have content that they don't agree with, not that's wrong, not that's offensive or fake, simply news that they don't agree with, then what they will do is demonetize your account and make it so that you can't make any money doing these videos at all. For instance, right now I'm making zero dollars and zero cents, unless you donate at the correct views at hotmail.com through PayPal. I'm making absolutely nothing. Okay, so what 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 is it that they're, they're they're against? Well, they're against anything that could be divisive or otherwise misconstrued as hurtful, right? They're protecting the world from me because I'm that scary, right? All right, well, let's take a look at some of the stuff that's allowed to remain on YouTube. Now, I don't know if it's monetized or not. I wouldn't be surprised if it was. Um. This is bothersome, friends. There's simply no other way to put it. When you, when you analyze what it is that they've done by putting these on here, and le they're leaving, what's the best way to put this? They are leaving ISIS reports up. Just leaving it up regardless of what horrible, why does my screen keep changing? Regardless of what horrible image it is that they have, whether it's an ISIS recruitment video, regardless of what it is, they're allowing that to remain. If I can ever get rid of the spam, I'll show you. Report, YouTube allows Islamic State videos to remain online for days, sometimes for weeks. According to a recent report from Motherboard that analyzed over 150 videos shared among pro-ISIS groups, YouTube continues to fail at properly policing extremist content. The report looked at 164 unique uh, YouTube URLs videos, which were shared in, in pro-Islamic state media channels, as well as a number of other relevant factors of the study, such as video content and how long it took for YouTube to take the clips down. What did Motherboard find? A video including an alleged audio message from an Islamic state spokesman Calling for attacks during Ramadan is still online. That's a week after being uploaded. 
several battlefield and street battle clips branded by the Islamic State's de facto news agency Amak are still online, two weeks after being uploaded, and a gruesome video of a Tehran, a Tehran attack remained on YouTube for nine days. Now, keep in mind, you're watching an offensive show here. God knows I've gone over the deep end and I'm scary now. Families are hiding under their tables, but they won't let me monetize this video. You watch. They won't. Ask me to prove it. They won't. And yet, IsisTube, word of the day, IsisTube, is allowing this to happen. Uh, and we all know what Google, GoogleTube, we'll also call it that, word of the day, IsisTube. We all know that Google has destroyed YouTube. Well, let's look at some of the things they're in favor of here. The amount of time this content remains online matters, and the amount of eyes it reaches very much matters. The people who are seeking out this content are already curious and perhaps interested in joining the fight for ISIS. Dayish. The impact of these videos is similar to the impact of an explosive because each video can produce a new extremist and a new sympathizer. To the ignorant, the mysterious, and the foreign, it is often taken as misunderstood and misrepresented, making it attractive. In other words, they're turning it into the new punk rock. That's what they're doing. And we're just sitting back watching it happen as if nothing at all is unusual here. Oh, nothing to see here. Just move on, right? Well, I'm sorry. There is definitely something to see here. You mean to tell me that pro-Trump supporters, that Mark Dice is more dangerous than ISIS? You mean to tell me I'm somehow more dangerous than terrorist videos because I believe in the Constitution? What the hell is wrong with that? But you'll listen to this. Will you share it? Will you do something with it? Will you let other people know, hey, YouTube is leaving ISIS videos up? Or will you just listen to me talk and then quickly scan on to something else? Because if so, I'm going at some point to get very frustrated. I'm dead honest, people. It matters. Look at this. There's another one. No longer a conspiracy. This is from the Daily Sheeple. Yes, I know it says Prison Planet, but they're just an aggregate. No longer a conspiracy. Elite openly paying to ingest blood of the young. That's right, blood drinkers, friends. <laughs> Lady Bathory, for those of you that don't know who she is, we're gonna go, I might as well earn my, uh, my non-demonetized, my demonetized status, if you will, by giving you a scary story. Lady Bathory was an, an, a ruler who would take the blood of young virgins and other girls to whom she was envious of. She would kill them and she would bathe in their blood, believing that it kept her young. That's why so many vampire movies have the name Bath Theory or some form of it. Uh, Bathara, something like it, that's why. Well, once the talk show conspiracy theorists, the young ingesting the blood of the... the, the, the yeah, the rich ingesting the blood of the young to foster longevity is now a reality and an actual business in the United States. Not only is it a business, but billionaires are actually admitting their interest in it. I'm looking into paraboasis stuff, which I think is really interesting. This is where they did the young blood into older mice and they found out a massive rejuvenating effect, Peter Thiel, the billionaire co-founder of PayPal and advisor to Donald Trump, Inc. told, uh, told Inc. magazine. I think there's a lot of those that have been strangely underexplored. But it's no longer an experiment with just mice. The startup company by Jesse Kamarazin, Ambrosia, is doing it with humans, and the rich are lining up to get the blood of the young. As Vanity Fair reports, Ambrosia, which buys its blood from blood banks, now has about 100 people, 100 paying customers. Some are Silicon Valley technologists like Thiel, Though Karamazin stressed that tech types aren't Ambrosia's only clients, and that anyone over 35 is eligible for the transfusions. Now, again, what if they find out this does some great and wonderful thing? That, look, look. Even if this ends up being the cure-all be-all, even if someday I end up needing to have it done, and there's a difference between needing to have something done and wanting to have it done, but... 
The point is that this has been reported on by a large number of people for a long time. We know from the whole spirit crooking thing that there is a great interest. If you don't know what that is, look it up. It's on my channel, The Correct View Spirit Cooking. There's this interest in blood and things like it, and even if this is a medical cure of some kind, I think it's important to understand that this is bigger than that. As the Free Thought Project reported in January, a study published in Science and Nature Medicine revealed that transfusing young mouse blood into old mice actually prevent the symptoms of aging. This groundbreaking discovery could lead to breakthroughs in the development of new medicines. However, a report from Vice House outlet Tonic has pointed out far more sinister applications for this knowledge. It was suggested in the report, it says, that aging elites are using the blood of young people as a type of youth serum. Now, we know where they're actually using it. A similar claim was made by journalist Jeff, I think it's Berkovici, last year, after he conducted several interviews with Silicon Valley aristocrats, including Peter Thiel, and learned about this transfusion procedure called parabiosis, where the blood of young people is used to prevent aging. There's a quote, There are widespread rumors in Silicon Valley where life extension science is a popular obsession, that various wealthy individuals from the tech world have already begun practicing parabiosis, spending tens of thousands of dollars on the procedures, and young person blood, and repeating the exercise several times a year. Now, again, we've, they've talked about the murders that have happened over the years for blood, the human sacrifice that has happened around the time of the American Revolution. Cannibalism was popular among the royals. It says that Dr. Sug of Durham University has conducted extensive research into the practice of corpse medicine among the royalty. The human body has been widely used as a therapeutic agent in the most popular treatments involving flesh, bone, or blood. Cannibalism was not only found in the New World, as often believed, but also in Europe, he said. So, here's what we're looking at. Um, it says here that there is no clinical evidence that the treatment will be beneficial, and you're basically abusing people's trust in the public excitement around this, said Stanford University neuro neuroscientist Tony Rice Corre. All right, <clears throat> this is where we draw the common sense line at the correct views. If there was some kind of scientific merit to this, I wouldn't be totally against it. I know I made a lot of people on the right mad, when I said that I wasn't totally against embryonic stem cell research, as long as we quit doing it when we found something better. And thankfully they did. Uh, adult stem cells actually work much better, and that's what we've been using. But to rewind, or I should say to apply it to this situation, I think it's very important to note that it could have some kind of medical merit. But that's not the underlying infatuation that people had with it. If it had no health connotations at all, I promise you these jackals would still do it. And the reason they would do it is because they're infatuated with blood and all things occultic. Now, it doesn't matter if you believe in God or the devil or not. It doesn't matter if you believe in the practices of spirit cooking. That's irrelevant. What matters is that they do. And these are the... If, if your leaders and your rulers are going to believe in some kind of a god, even if you're an atheist, doesn't it make you a little uncomfortable that they always pick the most sinister, evil gods? Never, never a loving or caring god. <clears throat> you never hear about a leader sneaking off to go to a Christian church. It's always something like skull and bones. There's a lot of logic in that. Don't just let it wash over. Friends, we got a couple stories to get to, but I want to show you real quick here something nice. This here, you're looking at the Seacrest Motel. That right there, right there, is where I stay when I go to Sandusky. That's where Christelle and I stay when we go to Cedar Point. There's my van, as a matter of fact, in that one picture. It really is, I'm not lying. It's actually our van. That's how often we stay there. I, I stayed there, that's right there, there it is. See it? It's great. I didn't even know they did it that day. The point is, we actually stay there that often. We really do. And I asked them to be a show sponsor, and they became one. I'm going to make a habit of that, because I like bringing people onto the show. 
that are doing something I can believe in. This is a mom and pop place. It's holding their own among all the chain outlets up there. And you'll get that room a lot cheaper than you think you will when you tell them, hey, I heard about you from the correct views. Her name is Vicki, and her son runs it as well. Make sure you let them know you heard about it, and then get ready, because this is where you're going to be staying, and you're going to be loving life. And if you see a black van, as long as you're friendly, make sure you come up and say what's up. All right, friends, moving on, check this out. A great white shark jumps into fisherman's boat, injuring 73-year-old man. Now... My friend, you might have seen him on the show, Beacon of Light, the Bulldog Calhoun. It came to my house. We were talking about fishing. And he came to the house to fish without any fishing tackle. Because his friend, which is probably now an ex-friend, stole all of his fishing tackle. So now I know what he did. I know what he went to the store and probably bought the entire fishing aisle for the next fishing trip. So... It'll be interesting to see, but I don't think that anything nearly as interesting is going to happen to him as happened to this person. However, if I come back missing a leg, you will know that it did. Great white shark jumps into fisherman's boat. You can't, you, this is awesome. We already talked about the shark that attacked the porn store, remember? The fisherman had lived to tell the tale of how he ended up with a great white shark in the bottom of his boat. He's a good fisherman. Terry Selward, 73, was fishing offshore, almost didn't live to be 74, at Evans Head in New South Wales' north coast when the shark launched itself into his boat. I caught a blur of something coming over the boat, and the pectoral fin of the shark hit me on the forearm and knocked me down to the ground on my hands and knees, Mr. Selwood said. He came right over the top of the motor and then dropped onto the floor. The shark jumped into the boat. He was 2.7 meters long and weighed 200 kilos. The boat measured 1.4 meters across, 4.5 meters long, a tight squeeze for a man and a shark. Remember, uh, Jaws? We're going to need a bigger boat. That's been Mandela affected, by the way. Look that up, too. There, was, there I was on all fours, and he's looking at me, and I'm looking at him. And he started to dance around and shake, and I couldn't get out quick enough onto the gunnel, Mr. Stellwood said. I was losing a fair amount of blood. I was stunned. I couldn't register what happened. And then I thought, oh my God, I've got to get out of here. What a shazam, Sparky! Mr. Sellerwood reached out for his radio and called the local marine rescue volunteers at Evans Island. Now keep in mind, the sharks have coarse skin, so that's why that happened. I mean, it's really not that big compared to other ones I've seen. Marine Rescue Unit Commander Karen Brown said a crew was sent out to rescue Mr. Sellerwood and then went back out a second time to retrieve the fisherman's boat and the shark. He must have come a four feet out of the water. There is the, uh, there's the shark. Do I have you guys on screen share down there? Yes, I do. Mr. Selwood said the conditions on Saturday afternoon when the incident happened was smooth and there was no surface fish or clear reason for the shark would breach. Therefore, you know what conditions to try to catch a shark in. I didn't have, to, I didn't have a barley out which does attract sharks, he said. I was using two little bits of blue pilker to, to fish for snapper at the bottom of the ocean, but the line was straight under the boat, not out back where he came from. For some reason, he just launched himself out of the water to come up four feet out of the water to clear my outboard and drop straight onto the boat. For such a close brush with the shark, Mr. Selwood came off relatively lightly and said it just bounced him around a bit. Struck his arm a couple times, thought he'd broke it, but he said, to be honest, but he just tore his skin off. Uh, people said I bitten, I was bitten by the shark, but I didn't. I just hit my arm because sharks have very rough skin. I just told you about that. Then he tore it off. He was taken to the hospital, treated for his injuries, uh, and fed a shark steak. No, probably not. He has since returned home where he said he was nursing a swollen arm, and he said he's never had one do this. At first, Mr. Selwood thought the animal was a Mako shark, but he was told by the Department of Primary Industries representative that it was a great white. Mr. Selwood said the DPI had lifted the shark out of the boat with a forklift and taken it away for an autopsy to confirm its age and gender. How did it die? Mr. Selwood said he had been fishing for close to 60 years, but had never been through anything like this. I've had them come up and brush the side of my boat. I've had a white pointer swim... 
Why is my phone going dead? But I've never had anything like this. Well, I bet he hasn't had anything like this. A great white jumped into his boat. Speaking of uh, great whites jumping into boats, I do think Bulldog is here. The, uh, the man who I just said uh, did not have anything to fish with. And then I know what he did. He went and bought the entire fishing gear and everything they possibly had at the store, didn't you? He brought the entire fishing, everything. All right, guys, I got to go because it looks like my phone is dying, even though it's plugged in, which doesn't make any damn sense. But we're going to go with it. Um... Oh, fine. Do whatever you want to do. Perfect. All right. Um, check this out, friends. I've been in the dumb D of the day here. I'm going to get my dumb D music on. Uh, the dumb D of the day here goes to everyone that doubted me. I told you that we were going to see a female NFL player. I said, what are we going to do the first time an NFL player is female? And I even went so far as to predict that she would be a kicker, because that's the most likely area, considering not only for women not to be destroyed, uh, not that all women would be, but most, um, is often, and also due to muscle mass. Like, women are better swimmers, by and large, than men, because they're almost more mus muscular than men are. They go through the water like a, like a great weight that jumps into your boat. Um, I predicted it would be a kicker that they would have the legs like a thoroughbred and be a kicker. So for our last story here, that's exactly what we have. For all of you dumdies of the day who doubted me, BleacherReport.com, is this the NFL's first female player? Becca Longo is 18. She can kick a further football further than you can. She's got a scholarship and she's just getting started. Boys, watch and learn. Um, it says that I'm going to skip the part about her being with her father. You can read that in the article yourself. But imagine that, a woman kicking in the NFL. This is how far the dream now stretches for Longo. This it's is the line in the game. Oh, I is love it. On it. Didn't add so. if you read this. Became the first female to earn a football scholarship in a Division I or Division II school when she signed with D2 Adams State in Alamosa, Colorado. The NFL. About a dozen women have played college football at various levels. In 1997, Les Heaston, which is what spawned me to make the prediction many years ago, Liz Heaston became the first female to score in a college football game when she kicked an extra point at Wilmot University in Salem, Oregon. And uh, it's an NAIA school. Uh, but it's safe to say that no female kicker has ever possessed the pure ability of this 5'11", 140-pound long goal who has kicked a 50-yard field goal in practice and routinely splits the uprights at 45. That is pro numbers, friends. Uh, the Browns know this because they can't ever actually score a touchdown, and if it wasn't for their kicker, they'd have no points at all. Um, it should be perfect in Cleveland. They'd welcome her like, like the prodigal daughter. I, it should be loved. She'd get her own statue. If you can play football and you have determination, I don't care what your gender is, <clears throat> says Tim. Mm, he's got two M's and a Tim Rosenbach a former NFL quarterback and the head coach at Adams State. Um, the, the, pick, the kicker is the loneliest player, it says. The female kicker, while she has isolated on the football team as a wildflower in the desert. Well, here's what a kicker does. When a kicker does great, you praise them and uh, you, for two seconds, and then you forget they're there. You know, it's gonna, it kicks, it's good. Although when you really need the kicker and he fails, you talk about him for a year when he misses one. It's, it, it's, the most, it's terrible to be a kicker. Um, it says the Longo, here's, I, I put it in a nutshell for you, friends. I don't have a problem with them doing it, but here's what we could run into. There are going to be some players that have a chance to take out the kicker. It happens now and again. And she's going to get plowed, and she's going to have to know that. And considering the intensity of the game... When it comes time to tackle her, you have to tackle her. Now, I've never tackled a girl, but I can tell you this. I took martial arts, <clears throat> and there was, and this is a great story. You'll be glad you stayed with me. Um, how many of you have seen Don Quixote, where he tries to fight the windmill? Yeah. Um, she was a black belt, and I was told to spar with her, and I was rather new in Taekwondo. But... At first, I didn't want to, but I decided, all right, I'll just move in and try to score something quick. So I went for, like, a, an upper leg kick. She came at me like a pterodactyl. 
I've never seen any with feet in all directions. I didn't know that a person had that many feet, but they all landed on me. <clears throat> okay, just that I never made that mistake again. Whoever I sparred, I outright sparred. Otherwise, you would die. Um, it's fine as long as everyone's fine with it. I don't see a reason to keep her out, but I can see this becoming a real problem in the future. Let me know what you guys think about it, especially the first time a girl has an arm like Tom Brady. It's going to happen, friends. It's going to happen sooner or later, and then it's going to be a trip when it does. Thank you, friends, for listening. Good night. God bless. You can donate if you want at the correct views at hotmail.com. Donate through PayPal. Remember, the word of the day, <coughs> ISIS tube. I'll send you autographed a bumper sticker and I'm all over the place. I'll send you some cool crap. Let me know where to send it, though. People keep giving me the word of the day <clears throat> and then not telling me what their address is, so yay. I need to know where to send you the stuff, guys. Good night. God bless. Thanks for listening.